Holmes was born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. He was given the name of Herman Webster Mudgett on May the 16th, 1861. He was the third born child to Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. His father was described as an alcoholic who was severely abusive towards his entire family. Despite the abuse, Holmes was considered a high achieving and brilliant student at his school, which resulted in him being bullied by classmates. In an attempt to scare Holmes, the bullies forced him to stand face to face with a human skeleton and place the skeletal hands on his face. Holmes was initially frightened, but then suddenly he found the whole experience to be fascinating, later crediting that it cured him of his fears. The experience eventually resulted in Holmes becoming obsessed with death, and he later began to dissect animals as a hobby. He graduated from high school at the age of 16, and later married a woman named Clara Lovering. Together they had a son, who they named Robert Lovering Mudgett. Three years later, Holmes enrolled in the University of Vermont in Burlington, but left one year later. In 1882, he entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery and graduated two years later. While he was a student there, Holmes stole several cadavers from the laboratory, disfigured the bodies and claimed that the victims were killed in accidents in order to collect the insurance money. Holmes eventually abandoned Clara and Robert and spent the next years working on various jobs and inventing more scams. This lust for wealth would prove to be fatal for many who would cross his path. He moved to Moore's Forks, New York, and was seen to be in the company of a little boy who later went missing. Holmes claimed that the boy went back to his home in Massachusetts and subsequently left town. The police believed his claim and no investigation took place. He later got a job as a keeper at Norristown State Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but quit days later. While he was in Philadelphia, he began to work at a local drugstore. During his time there, a small boy died from taking medicine that was bought from the store. Just like the previous time, Holmes denied any involvement with the boy's death before quickly leaving the city. Holmes later changed his birth name to Henry Howard Holmes to avoid being caught for his previous scams and then moved to Chicago, Illinois. While still married to Clara, he married another woman, Myrta Belknap, and had a daughter with her, Lucy Theodate Holmes. Holmes tried to divorce Clara but failed. He then married another woman named Georgiana Yoke. In Chicago, Holmes began to work at Elizabeth S. Halton's drugstore and proved himself to be a hard-working employee. After the death of Halton's husband, she sold the drugstore to Holmes and was never seen again. When asked about her whereabouts, Holmes would say that she moved to California to be close to relatives.
Later, Holmes purchased an empty lot located across from the drugstore, where he built his inspired hotel building, dubbed the Castle by local residents. The ground floor was an arcade with various shops within. It was all in a very grand design. The castle was not a regular hotel, as it contained a labyrinth of rooms with doorways leading to brick walls, oddly angled hallways, stairways leading to nowhere, doors that could only be opened from the outside, and other strange constructions. To ensure that no one discovered how odd the building's design was, Holmes fired and hired construction workers on a continual basis. Holmes later met with a former criminal and carpenter named Benjamin Peitzel, who became his right-hand man. Guests staying at the hotel would open doors and see only solid brick. Some would enter a bedroom, hear hidden pipes quietly hiss to life, and smell the gas seeping in. They would try to run and realize they were locked in. And even if the door could be opened, the chances are they would never find their way out. Only Holmes himself knew all of the castle's secrets, including just how many people had died within its walls. The first floor was for storefronts, the third floor held apartments, and the second floor and basement hid the elaborate chamber of horrors for which the H.H. H. Holmes Hotel is now infamous. There were hinged walls and false partitions. Some rooms had five doors and others had none. Secret airless chambers hidden underneath floorboards, and iron plate-lined walls that stifled all sound. Holmes' own apartment had a trapdoor in the bathroom, which opened to reveal a staircase that led to a windowless cubicle. In the cubicle, there was a large chute that tunneled through to the basement. And no, this wasn't used for dirty laundry. One elegantly disguised death room was lined with gas fixtures. Here, Holmes would seal his victims in, flip a switch in an adjacent room, and wait. Another chute waited nearby. All of the doors and some of the steps were connected to an intricate alarm system. Whenever someone stepped into the hall or headed downstairs, a buzzer would sound in the fiend's lair on the second floor. When police started searching the horror basement, they found bones. Many bones. Most of them were animals, but some of them were human. So small they had to have belonged to children, no more than six or seven years old. When they descended into the cellar, the scope of the building's hidden horrors was revealed. Beside a gore-covered operating table, they found a woman's blood-soaked clothes. Another surgical service was nearby, along with a crematory, an array of medical tools, a bizarre torture device, and shelves of disintegrating acids. The hotelier's fascination with dead bodies had lasted long past college, as had his surgical skills. After dropping his victims down through the chutes, he would dissect them, clean them, and sell the organs or skeletons to medical institutions or on the black market. Often his victims were not guests, but his employees. During his two short years in the castle, Holmes hired more than 150 women to work as his stenographers. A few of those were known to be his mistresses as well, 
Most of them came from wealthy families and many of them never saw those families again. Holmes sometimes photographed his favorites. They were young, beautiful and very trusting of this handsome gentleman in the big and unfamiliar city. One of his victims had become his mistress, a one Julia Smythe, who was married to a man named Ned Connor at the time of her murder. Connor eventually discovered Smythe's relationship with Holmes and moved away, leaving Smythe and their daughter Pearl alone with Holmes. In 1891, Smythe told Holmes that she was pregnant with his baby and demanded they be married. He agreed to marry her but was insistent that there should be no more children to come between them both and suggested performing an abortion, she agreed. Holmes later overdosed Smythe with chloroform before poisoning and butchering Pearl. When asked about their whereabouts, Holmes replied that they had left to attend a family wedding in Iowa. To articulate Smythe's skeleton, Holmes hired a man named Charles Chapel and showed him the body. Chapel took the arms and legs to his home to articulate them, followed by the rest of the body. Chapel was hired again twice, but the second time Holmes refused to pay the money he owed him. In response, Chapel refused to give him the skeleton and kept it in his home. Later, Holmes met with a railroad heiress named Minnie Williams while on a business trip in Boston, Massachusetts. They began dating and entered into a romantic relationship. Holmes eventually returned to Chicago but constantly sent love letters to Williams. In February of 1893, Williams moved to Chicago and began to work at his hotel as his personal stenographer. Holmes persuaded her to transfer the deed to her property in Fort Worth, Texas to a man named Alexander Bond, who in reality was Holmes himself. In April 1893, Williams transferred the deed and later signed the deed over to Benton L. Lyman, an alias used by Peitzel. Williams later invited her sister Annie over to Chicago. Shortly after her arrival, Holmes and Annie became close friends. While working in his office, Annie was asked by Holmes to get a file for him inside his vault. As she searched for the file, Holmes locked her inside and gassed her, before poisoning her sister. Following the World's Fair, Holmes left Chicago and moved to Fort Worth. There, he planned to construct another castle, but eventually abandoned the project. In July 1894, Holmes was arrested and incarcerated for the first time for a horse swindle that caught up with him in St. Louis. While in jail, Holmes met with convicted train robber and famous Wild West outlaw Marion Hedgepeth, Aka the Debonair Killer. Holmes had a plan to swindle an insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on himself and then faking his own death. He promised Hedgepeth a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who could be trusted. Holmes was directed to an attorney named Jephthah Howe who found Holmes's plan to be brilliant. 
Nevertheless, Holmes's plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious and refused to pay out. Holmes decided wisely not to press the claim and instead formulated a similar scheme with Peitzel. The second scheme involved Peitzel being an inventor named B.F. Perry, who was killed in a lab accident. The original plan was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Peitzel, but instead Holmes knocked Peitzel unconscious with chloroform and burned him alive with benzene. He eventually collected the insurance and manipulated Peitzel's wife into allowing three of her children, Alice, Nellie and Howard, to be given over to his custody. While traveling throughout the northern US and into Canada, Holmes forced both Alice and Nellie into a trunk and gassed them to death. He then buried their bodies inside the basement of a rental house. A detective named Frank Geyer found the body some time later and noticed that Nellie's feet had been amputated. He eventually discovered that Nellie had a club foot and theorized that Holmes had removed it in order to prevent identification of the body as it was a very distinctive body part. Geyer followed Holmes to Indianapolis. There, Holmes visited a local pharmacy to purchase drugs which he later used to kill Howard. After killing the little boy, Holmes mutilated his body and removed his teeth before placing the corpse inside the rental home's chimney. In 1894, Hedgepeth informed on Holmes to police investigators because he had not been paid as promised for assisting his schemes. Holmes was arrested in Boston after being tracked down by a detective agency known as the Pinkertons for horse theft. Several castle employees were interviewed after his arrest. One of them, the caretaker Pat Quinlan, mentioned to the police that he was never permitted to clean the second floor. This information sparked an interest to search Holmes's castle and in particular the mysterious second floor. There, Holmes's secret rooms and torture chambers were discovered. Police also investigated the basement in hopes of finding more evidence against Holmes. And several human bones were found. While exploring deeper within the hotel, a plumber lit a match and triggered a sudden explosion, injuring several men. It was later discovered that the cause of the explosion was an oil tank hidden behind the wall. In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Peitzel, was found guilty and sentenced to death. He initially claimed to be innocent and that he was driven to commit his murders because he was possessed by the devil. On May the 7th, 1896, Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing World. Before his death, he asked for his coffin to be encased in cement and buried ten feet down to deter grave robbers. After the hangman's rope dropped, Holmes's neck did not snap and as a result he was strangled for over 15 minutes before eventually being pronounced dead after hanging there for some 20 minutes.
Holmes varied in his victimology and modus operandi. His targets were usually employees, lovers, and hotel guests. Some of them were locked in soundproof rooms fitted with gas lines that would let him asphyxiate them. Others were taken to the secret hanging chamber, where they would be hanged by Holmes. Others were locked in a soundproof bank vault and left to suffocate. And some were taken to another secret room that was sealed up by solid bricks and could only be entered through a trapdoor in the ceiling. These victims would be locked in there and left to die from starvation and dehydration. After their deaths, Holmes would take the bodies to a metal chute or a dummy elevator leading to the basement, where most of them were dissected, stripped of their flesh, crafted into skeleton models and sold to medical schools. Alternatively, Holmes would dispose of them in lime pits, incinerate the bodies or use corrosive acid, poison and even a stretching rack on the poor victims. According to Holmes, he even once sent an unnamed accomplice to kill a man named Milford Cole for him. Although Holmes was witnessed to have been hanged until his body showed no signs of life, rumors persisted that he had somehow escaped the sentence of the court and had been spirited away to South America by paid accomplices. So in 2017, a team of scientists from Penn State exhumed the alleged body of Henry Howard Holmes to test its DNA. And so digging began on the site of his purported final resting place. The effort to dig up the body of H. H. Holmes, real name Herman Webster Mudgett, was spearheaded by retired trial lawyer Jeff Mudgett, the great-grandson of the killer himself. He was not only curious himself to find out if the remains in the grave were actually those of his ancestor, but also to silence the rumors once and for all. The exhumation team were quite shocked after reaching and opening the wooden casket, inside was not what they had expected. All rumors have now been laid to rest. It was indeed the evil hotelier Holmes in that grave. After prying open the fragile wooden casket, they were confronted by a handful of dirt. Not to be deterred, they continued to dig deeper down. Groundwater and partially hardened concrete was discovered further down inside the grave. This turned out to be a cement sarcophagus. In it, they found the skeleton of a man the skull, along with teeth and a necktie, sported the remains of a mustache which adhered grimly to the decayed flesh. Nothing much was left of the body except vile-smelling sludge, but interestingly, the suit in which the body was buried was almost perfectly intact. An iron crucifix bearing the name of the serial killer was also found in the grave. The remains were so decayed that the DNA wasn't preserved well enough to test it against the great-grandson, as was the original plan. But the skull proved to be in very good condition, and the dental records were enough to prove beyond doubt that the body was indeed H. H. Holmes himself.
Well, my dear viewers, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Uh, I've been actually meaning to do uh, the video about H.H. Holmes for quite a long time now, and I uh, kept forgetting, and some good viewers reminded me. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of myths surrounding H.H. Uh, H. Holmes and, and what actually went on there in his castle. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these myths were caused by the sensationalist press um, at the time, uh, who made quite a lot of stories up. Um, and also, Holmes himself, after his arrest, uh, admitted to murders that he couldn't possibly have done. Uh, so, But I'm sure he, he actually did a lot more that we don't even know about that he didn't admit to. Uh, he used a lot of aliases and he traveled around a lot. Who knows how many women and children went missing uh, and he probably never confessed to that. Uh, he never admitted to that boy that went missing, uh, and it's quite obvious that the boy met foul play at his hands, at Holmes' hands. So, who knows? Quite a, quite a monster who walked upon the earth. Yes, regarding his hotel, his infamous hotel, the castle, uh, the so-called castle, um, it was originally called Inglewood Flats and was originally only two stories high. Uh, he built the third story for the 1893 World's Fair um, and decided to put that uh, third story as hotel rooms to try and cash in on that event um, and also to use the furniture that he had gathered. Uh, probably not many people know this, but that was his original scam in building this uh, structure was to order furniture expensive furniture from different manufacturers and uh, he would not pay the bills uh, yeah many times they, they sent the, um, the the bailiffs looking for him and he, he had the stuff hidden um, eventually uh, one of his workers uh, grasped him up and informed on the police where he had hidden this furniture but that's what the the building was originally used for to to store all this furniture as you can see by the receipts here uh, yeah, so that was one of his many scams, and uh, he probably thought, well, I'll put that furniture to use with a hotel, and um, yeah, that's that. And the, the building, a lot of people say that it was burnt down uh, about a year after his execution. Uh, not true. It was knocked down in the 1930s or 40s. I think it was 40s. They wanted to make way for a, a large post uh, post office building, and so then it was knocked down. Um, and yeah, yeah. What what's all this with the stenographers? Hundred and fifty. My God, I hope they all didn't meet an untimely fate uh, in Mister Holmes's castle. Hundred and fifty stenographers can't really get over that. Quite amazing. Yes, the thing is with these monsters, these serial killers. Um, quite often they don't look like monsters, uh, as in the case of H. H. Holmes. Um. Yeah, he wasn't a bad-looking bloke, really. If you look at the, the photo when he was young, um, I could quite imagine women being quite taken by him and, and trusting him, not realising he had an evil soul, the the mind of a yeah, of an insect or an alien. It's just, yeah. I know, I'm not, if any aliens are listening, I'm not saying you're like that, but it, it's an alien mind to, to, what we're, to what we class as a human mind. I mean, he just had no comp passion at all and uh, horrific horrific the the things that he did setting people on fire when they're still alive and uh, slowly gassing them and uh, no doubt being able to watch that that, that shows a, a perverse pleasure in in seeing them die slowly yeah and, and, and killing children like that just callous totally callous um he seemed to be motivated by money primarily, uh, but he must have got a kick out of the murder. He must have to set up this um, the torture chamber business and the uh, carefully uh, planned uh, and uh, intricate methods he had of disposing of his victims. Yeah, really, really. He had a really quite a nice end, didn't he? In comparison to some of his victims. Anyway, I think that's about it. I'm going to wrap it up. It's over half an hour, 30, 31 minutes now. 
into the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it was my pleasure bringing it to you and got many more exciting ones to come in the future. And, and thank you all, as always, for your support. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And bye-bye until next time, my friends.